So we need to eliminate human deprivation and ecological degradation at the same time. And this hasn't been done before. This has barely on a global scale been tried before. The 20th century was all about eliminating human deprivations. And, and it's turned out that the way a lot of that was done has leaked out into this ecological overshoot. So we can't use old economic theories or old government policies, old business models. We need new ones of our own times. This shape of progress that has been put at the heart of Western economics is only really since the 1930s and 40s. So it's not even 100 years old. It's quite young. And it began uh, post crash, 1929 crash in the US. A brilliant scientist, a brilliant economist called um, Simon Kuznets was asked by US Congress to come up with one number to measure the output of the American economy. Uh, because until then it had all been measured in tons of steel and tons of grain and he did he came up with this one number he figured out a way to add it all together and it became what we call national income or, or or gdp gross domestic product and he gave a warning too though that this this was scarcely a measure of a nation's welfare but the warning was pushed aside because the number the power of the one number is so great and once Policymakers had this one number of the output of the economy and then it was started to be measured across countries. The obvious next question they began to ask is, and how much bigger does it get each year? Because the idea that the economy growing became synonymous with success. And when you have a labor intensive economy where the growth of the economy means more workers are employed in the factories, means more people are going home with a big pay packet in their pocket, means more families can provide for their essential wants and needs. Things go well, it seems to work. Growth became seen as the panacea for any country's problems, whether it's unemployment or inflation or a balanced trade deficit or inequality. And this is the shape of progress that 20th century Western economics, we want it to grow endlessly to the end that never ends. It would just keep going up through the ceiling. And what's extraordinary to me is that even in today's richest countries, and I'm sitting in one of them in the UK, across Europe, across the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, these are countries that are richer than any nation has ever been before. And yet listen to the economists, listen to the politicians, and they will tell you that the success of these nations, even these nations, lies in yet more growth without end and there's something profoundly absurd about that but also when we just look around we see that the growth that we've been getting has not gone to the workers into their pay packets because actually we've seen national incomes grow rapidly and the money a lot of that in from in the us particularly the vast majority of that growth is going into the hands and the pockets of the one percent and the average worker is seeing no increase in their wages over the last decade the number of billionaires has doubled from a thousand billionaires to two thousand billionaires and so we see the rise of a one percent holding all opportunity value concentrated in their hands and this utterly undermines the ability that regenerative flow between people it creates a really deeply unequal economy we need to open that up and create a distributive economy where resources <laughs> eh, resources are shared far more equitably with all so growth is not delivering well-being for all. It's also delivering extraordinary ecological footprints on the planet through climate emi carbon emissions, through our material footprints. And so it's jeopardizing the health of the planet. And to me, this is a very serious reason why we need to rethink what's measured there. I think we can see the impacts of some of that, you know, here in our islands. Um, and, and we're struggling with many of those issues uh, where you know, we, we went from about 200 years ago, a fairly self-reliant community, um, you know, with indigenous knowledge and systems and these long-standing familial kin-like relationships with the natural world and the environment in many ways. Um, and this, you know, steady transition towards uh, this more extractive <laughs> economy, you know, from sandalwood to 
uh, large scale sugar plantations uh, to where we're at now in, in battling tourism. Um, and, and although the numbers keep going up, uh, at least prior to COVID, you know, it was six million tourists, eight million tourists. And just like you're saying, that growth, uh, being on islands, we can see there are a finite amount of resources around us. And you know, the, the larger the numbers got, didn't necessarily meant more, <laughs> better well-being for the people here in the island. Is there a benefit for Hawaii to, to try to become a circular economy? It's a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. It's just one way we can imagine it. There are many ways. But if you imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this picture, then the hole in the middle here is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life. It's a shortfall for people's ability to have decent food, healthcare, education, housing, political voice, income, community, shelter. And these, I, I crowdsourced these 12 social dimensions from the Sustainable Development Goals. And the reason I did that was because it, it, it just affirms that all the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim not to live in the hole in this donut. Whether or not they have income or not, whether or not the market serves their needs, let's start not with the market, but their needs. Everyone must get out of this hole across this social foundation. So we want to get leave no one in the hole, get everyone into a level of resource use where they're leading a life of dignity, opportunity and community. But, and this is a big 21st century but, but as we collectively use Earth's resources to meet these essential needs, we, we may use them carelessly or in ways where we put so much pressure on the life supporting systems of our planetary home that we begin to kick up against this ecological ceiling. This is the point beyond which we actually risk tipping our planetary home out of balance, where we risk causing climate breakdown and acidifying the oceans. We risk creating a hole in the ozone layer and breaking down the fabric of life through biodiversity loss, that we actually break down the fabric of what makes life work. And these are known as the nine planetary boundaries. So putting those together, the goal of the donor is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And you can immediately see, and to me, visuals are very, very important. You can immediately see that the shape of progress has fundamentally changed. There's no infinite growth here. This is about thriving in balance. The word for wealth in Hawaiian, um, in, in some of our work, um, you know, we recognize is, is wai wai, is, is water, water. So the word for water is wai, <laughs> and the word for wealth is wai wai, water, water. And, and really what that, is suggesting from our, our kupuna, our ancestors, is that wealth is should be like you know the water cycle, and and you know it should come in patterns. You know it, it should repeat itself. And and a person uh, that was wealthy is someone that could distribute water, could feed people, um, and and provide for their community. And can I say that? So we're talking about the concept of circular economy. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge, as you just did, that actually that's, a, a, that's again, a, a modern label, name given to something that has been practiced by peoples worldwide. Otherwise, they would not have thrived and survived on whether on islands or on lands where the resources are what you're working with. And it, it's a regenerative economy by design. And I think circular economy is drawing on and learning from and probably not yet learning enough from many, many indigenous cultures, island cultures, where that was a necessity of a way of living. Well, if I come back to the donut briefly, here's the donut, here's where we want to be, but that's not where we are, right? This is where we are. All of the red in this image shows us on the global scale, this is all the billions of people worldwide who are falling short on their essential needs. We want to eliminate all of that red human shortfall, but at the same time, we need to come back within these planetary boundaries on climate breakdown, on excessive fertilizer use, excessive land conversion, biodiversity loss, and locally, of course, many places have real pressure on these. If you've got to turn that linear economy into what we're talking about, that circular or cyclical one, so that resources aren't used up, they're used again and again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively, and slowly. And some people call that a circular economy. I think the bigger name for it is a regenerative economy. That's the, 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 
the YY, that's the cycle going round. For, for decades, GDP has been the thing where economists have put so much time and effort into measuring it quarter on quarter on quarter, and it's reported in the news. But now we have data almost in real time about natural and social metrics, measuring and listening to planet Earth in her own metrics. Why would you flatten those into a number with a dollar sign in the front of it?